happiness is something we all want. The problem is that we have different ideas of what constitutes happiness. In fact, each person has different ideas about what constitutes happiness. This is why we have so many committee members in the mind. Each has his or her own idea that has or hasn't been tested, and is all too happy to recommend it, whether or not it's been tested. And with very little discussion about what the standards would be to count as something that's truly happy, or an activity that's truly good. That right there is, a, is an interesting equation. Some people don't equate goodness with happiness. It's all the great people in the past, though, who said, to be truly happy there has to be goodness as well. The two have to go together. This is why we wish well for ourselves, and if we have any intelligence, we wish well for others. This is where the goodness comes in. We don't want our happiness to depend on anyone else's suffering. We start our meditation every day with a chance on goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, to remind us of our motivation for practicing. We want a happiness that's special, something that's lasting, something that's blameless, and at the same time as a gift to others. Because you notice when the Buddha talks about goodwill, it's always unlimited, immeasurable. All around, up and above, down, below. Every possible adjective he can use to describe that this is total in every direction, without exception. We want to have goodwill for everyone. Our goodwill is unlimited, but our strength and other resources are limited. This is a fact we have to live with. On the one hand, admitting our limitations, but then two, figuring out how we can strengthen ourselves so at least we have something less in terms of limitations on our strength and our ability to do good in the world and to do good for ourselves. That's why the Buddha talks about strengths. There's a strength of conviction that your actions really do make a difference. This derives from our conviction in the Buddha's awakening. He gained true happiness through his own efforts, and it's through qualities that were not exclusively his. In other words, the potential for these qualities exists in all of us, being resolute, being ardent, being heedful. These are all things we can do. We have them to some extent already. We're heedful about some things, we're resolute in some areas, and we're ardent in some things. The trick is strengthening these qualities and applying them in the right places. But it all comes down to qualities of the mind. And this leads right into the next strength, which is persistence. Once you see that the qualities of the mind are important, you have the desire to prevent unskillful ones from arising and let go of unskillful ones that have arisen. To give rise to skillful qualities and to abandon, <coughs> excuse me, and to develop the ones that have arisen, so they become fully developed. And you've got to keep this in mind. This is where mindfulness comes in as a strength, because it's so easy to forget. You get involved in, say, sensual desire, ill will, any of the hindrances, and. It just seems so convincing while you're in that world that the things you desire really are worth it, really are desirable, or the people that you feel ill will for really are horrible people, and you'd be really happy to see them suffer a little bit, or more than a little bit. When you get a little bit drowsy, ah, yes, the, the body needs to rest, you tell yourself. It's got all the signs. I just can't put in any more effort. 
and so on down the list. We believe these hindrances when we're in them, and so we have to be able to remind ourselves that no, they're not taking us in the direction we really want to go. When you can pull ourselves out, and this is what mindfulness is all about, recognizing a particular mind state and then remembering what we should do with it. Let go of the hindrances, develop the factors for awakening, and you gain the strength of concentration. This is really what gives food to the mind, because it gives you a source of pleasure, a source of well-being, an inner stability. That pushes against a lot of the limits you had in your mind before. And then there's a strength of discernment. Once you have this extra energy, what are you going to do with it? The Buddha said the best thing is to first take care of the problem of how you create suffering for yourself. I don't know how many people say that this seems selfish, but it's not. You take care of yourself first so that when you start thinking about helping other people, your help really is genuine. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to become an arahant and then help people. But the quality of your help is going to improve as you learn how to take care of your own problems inside. And John Sowat used to like to say, each of us has only one person, ourselves. That we can have some control over, that we can really make a difference inside. And as for the goodness you can develop beyond that, it's a gift to the world. It's something you're happy to leave behind if, if you're not coming back. And if you are coming back, well, what you've left behind in the world is going to be there to give you the strength to continue on. This is why the Buddha talked about our interaction with other people under two terms, under virtue and generosity. The virtue is holding back from doing things that are harmful, and generosity is all the spontaneous goodness we want to provide. It can be material things, it can be your energy, it can be your time. Setting an example for others, that too is a gift. The Buddha talks about virtue as being a gift. You give safety to others. At the same time, you give a good example. The world needs good examples. Because of the media, which seems to be taking over everybody's awareness of reality, trades in some pretty bad examples. Those are the ones that are easiest to find, say, on the net. They're all around us, and people begin to take them as patterns, as examples for how we ought to behave. You go into a place like an airport lounge or waiting at a bus station, train station, wherever, people are not looking at people anymore. They're looking at their little screens. So if we're going to change things, it's, it's not going to happen by appearing on somebody else's screen. You have to do something that's create an example that startles people. Makes them look up from their screens. That's very easy to do that with unskillful things, but to do it with something skillful takes a lot more subtlety. Which is why you have to learn how to be dealing with the subtle issues inside your mind. Give the Johns in Thailand. People took notice. At first they didn't take any notice at all. And John Mun was off in the forest, and there were few people who heard about him and had to follow him. Many times they were 
had no guarantee that they would be able to find him. They didn't know exactly where he was. They had a general idea. They heard where he had been. You read the stories of his students having to undergo a lot of hardships just to get to him. But that's the example of a really good person. Word begins to get around. This is someone who's out of the ordinary. Then there were people who didn't like what he was doing or didn't like what he was saying. And John Cha has an interesting discussion where he says that John Mun and John Sao tended to divide families. People, Some members of a family would be inspired by them and other people would be repelled by how different they were. So you don't really have any control over how other people are going to respond to your example, but you want to set a good example, as good as you possibly can. Not that you're showing off, but you want to have something that's really solid inside, and people with eyes and ears will notice that. And given the general state of the world now, they'll be startled. In some cases, you'll actually be able to talk to them about what's good in the practice. As the Buddha said, one of the best ways you can benefit others is to get them to be interested in getting rid of greed, aversion, and delusion, getting them interested in following the precepts so they can take care of the one person that each of them is responsible for. But that's something where you have to use your discernment, exactly how much you can actually say to other people and how willing they're going to be to listen. A lot of that has to do with their karma. And John Lee has a comment. He says, when you're trying to teach other people and they're not really interested, he says, it counts as idle chatter. We keep coming back to the fact that, as John Swat said, you have one person. That's the person you're really responsible for. And if you neglect this person to, to go around trying to straight, <clears throat> straighten out other people, you've got your priorities wrong. You've got to straighten out this one. That's your main focus. You've got to strengthen this mind so that the goodwill you have for yourself and the goodwill you have for others will have a better and better chance to be brought into being or to show its influence. So think about these five strengths. There's conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. These are the things that bring the limitations of your mind, take some of them down, take some of them away, so that the limitlessness of your goodwill has a better chance of getting expressed. <clears throat>